It's not been declared because there's a lot of um, dispute between the different um, landowners. Absolutely, I think it's essential to have it uh, proclamated as a World Heritage Site. The benefits are enormous. Um, once the area has been proclaimed in South Africa, then uh, international laws will also be applied. There's already a white paper. What's the point of having a World Heritage Site? Well, first and foremost, it, there will be rules and regulations that we all have to comply with. Privatise it and declare it. Then I'll be able to tell all the tourists that this is, in fact, a World Heritage Area. The Friedeford Dome is a geological wonderland not far from Johannesburg in South Africa. UNESCO declared it a natural world heritage site in 2005 because it is the oldest and largest meteorite impact site in the world. Ten sites in South Africa have achieved world heritage status since 1999. The Friedeford Dome may be a UNESCO declared World Heritage Site, but in terms of our own laws, it's not. Who is to blame? The answer lies in the differences among landowners and the indecisiveness of government and provincial authorities. Unfortunately, politics played a role every time. It was first the Free State against the Northwest, or the Northwest against the Free State. It was then the national government. Uh, and as, if I may say, politicians, they talk a lot, but they can't do anything. The main reason for the difficulties is, I think, perceptions, different perceptions, on the one hand of the landowners, on the other hand, perhaps, of government officials. Besides its natural beauty and unique biodiversity, the Friedeford Dome made the World Heritage Cut because of the area's geology. It is also the only place in the world where scientists can study an eroded remnant of a large crater made by the impact of a meteorite. This one is now a lekker old one. It is very nice to see. People can study it. It is also a great geological laboratory. And because this thing is deep in the ground, it has been 26 km in the earth course and it has been all out. Now you get in the middle clippen that in a period of 26, maybe over 30 km deep in the ground was. En als je van daar af uitloopt bij hem toe, dan loop je dus op een groot boorgatse kern. Loop je uit en uit en uit. Je ziet die hele aardkorst tot op die diepte. It happened more than 2000 million years ago. At that time, Friedefort consisted of basically four geological layers. Granite formed the bottom. Above that was the Witwatersrand supergroup containing gold bearing conglomerates. The third layer consisted of volcanic Ventersdorp lavas. And the top layer, or Transvaal supergroup, was a compilation of sedimentary rock types such as dolomite, shale and quartzite. To create a crater more than 90 kilometers wide, the meteorite must have been the size of Table Mountain, or even larger. It travelled at almost 40,000 kilometers an hour. The layers of the geological sandwich were at first deformed into a great dent with the crater in the middle. Around the crater, beds were overturned. In a matter of seconds, a rebound followed that filled up the crater and caused further up and overturning. From very deep, granite and gold-bearing conglomerates were brought to the surface, and after being exposed to the elements for millions of years, the structure and possible remnants of the meteorite have been eroded to a level where no crater can be distinguished. Although the crater is missing because of erosion, there are still enough shock-induced geological features to be studied. One can clearly see upturned and overturned rocks. Before the impact, these rocks were buried deep in the Earth's crust. Some estimates say up to 20 kilometers. Breccius referred to a variety of broken up rocks and they were formed when shock waves caused rocks like Chert to explode. Granifier tells a story of melted rocks and rapid cooling. 
the molten mass flowed into fractures caused by the impact, together with a shower of fragments from other rocks in the vicinity, maybe even from outer space. Shatter cones are evidence of shock in rock layers beneath meteorite impact craters. The geometry of a cone reveals the point of impact, the center of the crater, and also the direction of a shockwave. Pseudotachylite literally means looks like volcanic glass. Severe shock pulverized and fractured rock material to powder after impact. The powder and melt flowed into cracks and settled as a dark glass material upon cooling. Archean granite separated the Earth's crust from its mantle at the time of impact 2,000 million years ago. The same granite forms the dome's central core or basement today. This is surrounded by younger granite that geologists refer to as Parais granite. Conglomerate rocks with embedded white quartz pebbles indicate fast-flowing water at the time when this sedimentary layer was the surface. Some geologists believe that the Frederford blast forced rich gold deposits to the surface in the mining areas of the Witwatersrand and Free State. Old mine dumps and tunnels tell the story of gold seekers in the 1880s who never made it rich and who left the dome penniless hoping for better luck in the Witwatersrand. But in the beginning of this millennium, mining companies became interested in the dome's gold deposits once again. This caused a considerable stir among conservationists in the dome. This area is so unique in terms of nature and in, in the sensitivity of the ecosystem that it is amper unthinkable is to think that a mine maatskapie here can come and open up mine and in areas versteer with kloven where bomen is bestaan wat etelike honderde jare oud is. Verder vanuit de wereld waar je bestien zwaardig gaat is hier die geologische structuur wat hier internationale wetenschappelijk is op een gereelde basis bestudeerd wordt. Ons gaan alles in werking stel, al, al moet ons internationaal te werk gaan, maar alles binnen ons vermoeien zal ons voortgaan meer om hier acties te stoot. Hier gebied voldoen aan alle criteria wat benodig wordt voor die stichting van het werelderfenisgebied. Ons het dus goeie moed dat ons hier in die, ons doel sal slaag om hier die acties van die mijnbedrijvighede gestuit te kry. The threat of open cast gold mining in the dome was an impetus for conservationists and scientists to get the area listed as a world heritage site. At that time there was a conservancy of the landowners and they opposed the mining and one of the ways to oppose that was to get the site declared as a World Heritage Site. The process of getting listed as a World Heritage Site is a straightforward one. There are three types of World Heritage Sites. The first step is a tentative list of sites compiled by a state party. State parties are countries that are signatories to the World Heritage Convention. Next, the state party nominates sites from the tentative lists to be considered as a World Heritage Site. Specialized sections of the World Heritage Committee, or WHC, then evaluate and decide if the nomination is worthy of being listed as a World Heritage Site. If the nomination is successful, the state party has to proclaim the site by its own law as a World Heritage Site. The Frederford Dome was inscribed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site in July 2005 at its 29th session in Durban. It was primarily done because, according to the WHC, the Frederford Dome is the oldest, largest and most deeply eroded complex meteorite impact structure in the world. It is the site of the world's greatest single known energy release event. A lot of the preparations from the South African side was done by professors Franz Wanders and Andries Bischoff, as well as a renowned geologist, Dr. Martin Brunk. What they normally do, it is a closed vote and uh, uh, electronic or by paper. Some of them amazing at that meeting in, in Durban, some were by paper, some, some were by putting the hand in the air, but this was a closed vote because it was a new announcement. And when the votes were counted, not a single vote was against declaring the Frederford Dome as a World Heritage Site. Uh, we got a standing applaud from the uh, 
whole community that was there. The Free State and Northwest Provinces share the World Heritage Site that is bisected by the Vol River. The core area covers about 30 hectares. In the wake of the success in Durban, both the Northwest and Free State Provinces made initial moves. A World Heritage Office and Information Centre was established in the Fenterskroen village in 2006, and its opening by the Northwest government was a festive affair. Well, for the mere fact that we have established our presence here in this project today, uh, that in itself is indicative of our seriousness with regards to this project. The Free State Province followed suit and an impressive complex arose on a granite dome in the outskirts of Fredofort. Our view as government is that it cannot be possible to draft a management plan by yourself as a government officials or by uh, entities or maybe consultants. What we have to do is to embrace everybody, people in the area, people in the surrounding area, because they are also liable to protect the area. The excitement of being a UNESCO declared World Heritage Site faded slowly as the proclamation of the dome by South African government encountered numerous obstacles. South Africa complied with all the requirements prescribed by the World Heritage Committee, except proclaiming it in accordance with its own Act 49 of 1999, the World Heritage Convention Act. Act 49 of 1999 makes provision for, among other things, the establishment of management authorities and an integrated management plan to protect the integrity of our World Heritage sites. For all landowners, it is or should be important that um, the area be declared a World Heritage Site. If not, you can have uncontrolled developments, which is a serious threat for a site like this. Uh, there are a lot of unique features in the site. If it is not properly managed and protected, that it would be vandalised or taken away. I think the Fredefort Dome area is becoming a disaster area. Pollution, destruction, etc., etc. The government not doing enough to preserve it. If you think of Syria where uh, ISIS came and tried to destroy everything, Afterwards, they tried to rebuild it, so they tried to protect. In a television interview in 2007, the then Director General of the Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism, Dirk van Skalkwijk, blamed problems with boundary delimitations and differences between landowners about how the area should be managed as primary reasons for the delay. In Eckgloe, uh, I did what was under andere op hierdie stadium that the Grondeienaars is ten gunste van die, dat die gebied beskerm moet word. Ek dink dit gaan rondom sekere voorskrifte waar daar mag geld, wat miskien vir hulle problematisch kan wees, en dit sal ons moet aanspreek. Quite assured of himself, Van Skalkwijk promised that the dome would be proclaimed a World Heritage Site. Van die departementse kant af poog ons om werkelijk uh, hierdie gebiede allemaal teen 31 maart volgende jaar verklaar te hee. En jy vir my beloof vandag dat in april volgende jaar, dan is more than 11 years have elapsed since Van Skalkwijk made his promise, and since then, the lack of dedicated management structures have impacted negatively on the natural environment in the dome. A scenic flight for tourists along the Vol River with a noisy Huey helicopter did not only disturb the peace and tranquility of the dome, but also the breeding habits of the birds. Some lodge owners contributed to the pollution of the Vol River by pumping their sewage into a river that is already one of the most polluted in South Africa. With no integrated management plan and a management authority, the development of structures in the World Heritage Site went unchecked.
Since 2002, rehabilitated baboon troops were released in the dome. One release failed because nearly a third of the troop was poisoned and some baboons were shot. Despite warnings not to build the Fredefort Information Centre on an unstable granite dome, the Free State Government went ahead at a cost of millions. Today, this structure has been declared unsafe and none of the local population has been empowered as promised. The state had to contend with landowners who did not see eye to eye about the management of the dome according to the stipulations of the South African Act. With the current debate about expropriation of land without compensation, this debate will probably intensify. Of course there was always and still perhaps is the fear of expropriation in that the government might come and expropriate the land because of it being uh, a World Heritage Site. I think other fears from the landowner side, and once again a generalisation, uh, not everyone, is perhaps that uh, a mistrust of government, especially with bad governance. There are two distinguishable groupings on the issue. On the one side is a conservancy composed of landowners and supporters that basically favour the dome being proclaimed a World Heritage Site by the 1999 World Heritage Convention Act. The reason I think at this stage most probably is management. Uh, from all the different organisations I think we've got a unity in the structure but I think the conservancy at this stage is the way forward. Uh, this is not geology only but I think nature as well because we have uh, such a diverse uh, vegetation here. The microorganisms create such a huge thing. I think job creation can be unique if we can get this now registered as a World Heritage Site. I'm positive. At the moment uh, this area is still falling under the normal country laws, the farming laws. So in theory people can do the normal developments that they did previously. The regulations aren't so strict and if you look at mining activities they can get closer to the area and so forth. What's important now is that South Africa as a country gives the same recognition to the site and for that to happen a proclamation needs to be done in order to align the proclamation and and uh, the way uh, it falls within our own land management and land reform that it's part of the South African legislation and that it's covered by that. Sometimes I just keep quiet about the status of the World Heritage Area and rather uh, show the people or tell the people other things about the uniqueness of the meteorite impact structure. Opposed to the Conservancy are landowner associations of the Northwest and Free State. At the heart of the quarrel are the powers and membership of the management authority. <laughs> Deval Negrini from the Northwest Landowners was invited to participate in this documentary and he accepted. On the day the camera crew arrived at the arranged time at Negrini's farm, the dome. Nobody knew about his whereabouts. When we phoned him, he said there must be some confusion, and he ended the conversation with the following remark, I am an advocate and I am at my chambers in Santon. Anyway, I don't have time for playing games. Speaking at a public meeting of Northwest and Free State landowners on Saturday 8 May 2010 at Kumandunak, Negrini, who acknowledged the presence of the media, refused to attend a forthcoming meeting at that time between the government, conservancy members and landowner associations. The 24ste is daar een vergadering beroep. Ek het die uitnodiging nie om dit by te woon. Ek gaan dit nie bywoon nie. Ek sal dit nie bywoon nie. Negrini also referred to property rights. Jy weet hulle voorvaders het hond gehad loop en mekaar gejaag sonder om te acht te slaan op grense enigszins. Daar is nie een program in hulle koppe, wat eindomsrecht rechtig verstaan nie. So, dis die selfde mense wat dan intern gaan besluiten neem oor hoe, wat hulle kommentare is geldig en nie geldig nie, en as dit klaar is, daarmee gaan hulle finale stelregulaties finaliseer en geloof my, hulle sal dit nie eers vir ons weis nie, hulle gaan net proklameer daarmee. Some say there is a light at the end of the tunnel. But at the end of 2018, very little real progress has been made to proclaim the Fredefort Dome as a World Heritage Site. 
Another setback was the death of Edna Molewa, Minister of Water and Environmental Affairs, in September 2018. Molewa was well aware and informed of the issues. Optimists, however, believe that obstructionists base their issues on unfounded fears and that these fears can be successfully resolved. And I'm sure it's possible. I've got no doubt that if everyone has sufficient information and the correct information and they sit around a table, it can be sorted out expeditiously. <laughs> Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! <laughs>